Okay, everyone, welcome. Um, it's such a pleasure to see uh, so many names coming into today's webinar. Uh, my name is Sarah Cohen, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2020 Open Textbook Network Summit. Thank you so much for joining us for today's session with our executive director and founder, Dave Ernst. Um, before we begin, um, if you are not familiar with the Open Textbook Network, um, we are a community of higher ed organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. You can learn more about us at open.umn.edu slash OTN. I'm going to serve as facilitator for today's session. And I am joined by all of my colleagues, um, but Barb Thies, our community manager at the OTN, will be moderating the Q&A. Before we begin, we'd like to share a few important details with you. The hashtag for the OTN Summit is OTN Summit 20. We are live tweeting this session, so please join us on Twitter at at open underscore textbooks. That's coming into uh, the chat in just a moment. Please note that today's webinar is being recorded. For that reason, you have been muted. The video and the transcriptions will be posted on the OTN's YouTube channel after the summit has concluded. You can subscribe by going to z.umn.edu slash OE dash videos. Please note that we are also um, using uh, transcription in today's session. Um, if you find that distracting at all, you can just go down to the bottom of your screen and hide um, the transcription. The last few minutes of today's session will be for questions. So to submit a question, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. The questions um, will not, we won't be able to take everybody's questions, um, but the questions submitted are anonymous. Finally, we are committed to providing a friendly, safe and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at z.umn.edu slash summit community norms. We ask you to join us in creating a safe and constructive space for all attendees. Now, it is my pleasure to hand things over to our founder and executive director, Dave Ernst, who is kicking off today's summit. Dave. Thanks, Sarah. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the kickoff of the 2020 Open Textbook Network Summit. And I'm David Ernst, I'm the Executive Director of the OTN. And uh, we're all just so very happy that you're with us here today. This is our sixth OTN Summit. Um, and if you've attended a summit in the past, you might have noticed a few changes this year. Um, this is our very first virtual summit. Uh, and because they're normally held uh, two or three days long held here in Minnesota where I'm at. Uh, but this year, the summit is obviously going to be held like everything else in our lives uh, for a few hours each day for the next two weeks over Zoom. Um, we, uh, one of the other things that's changed, obviously, one of the benefits of this is that we're, we're so happy that there are people joining us from outside the community. When we held our community meetings, our summits every year, um, uh, in Minnesota, it was for our members. And because this is virtual, we really decided it would be beneficial to open it up to anybody who really wanted to, to attend. And many of our sessions, most of our sessions in the next two weeks are obviously open to everyone. So welcome to those of you who are not uh, officially part of the o Open Textbook Network community. We welcome you. Um, because we might have people who are um, who are not uh, OTN members, I do want to tell you a little bit, just really briefly about who the OTN is. Um, this is one representation of the Open Textbook Network. These are our member institutions. Uh, some of our members are institutional, individual institutions. Uh, some join through statewide systems or consortia. 
Uh, we have memberships representing nearly 1,300 institutions so far um, total. Um, so this is our network of institutions that are members of the OTM, but I, I would say, have to say that this is not a good representation of the OTM community. Uh, this is uh, the OTM team. Uh, these are the uh, amazing people that wake up every day and work to make this community a better place uh, for all of us. They help us to make more of an impact and to grow as professionals and to bring us together over our common goals. And so um, they are, I, I don't have time, we don't have time to kind of individually uh, uh, call each one of them out, but they're an amazing group of people. And your, uh, as an example, your experience over the next few weeks in the summit sessions are due to the planning of Sarah, Tanya, Karen, Craig, and Barb. Uh, they just spent countless hours planning this year's virtual OTM summit. So if you get a chance to thank them, please do. And while these folks are, are such a critical, important part of the community, I would also say they are, that they are not, not the OTM community. Um, this is the OTM steering committee. These folks volunteer their time to help guide us. We can uh, bring challenging questions to them and we can always count on them for their honest feedback, their suggestions and their perspectives. I wanna thank them all for their uh, commitment and support. And again, while they are a really important part of this community, I would also say that they are not the OTM community. A part of it, but they're not it. This is a more accurate representation of our community. Uh, these are the people who contribute to the network community, the OTM community in some way. It might be that they are leading or part of a working group that we have, or they're workshop presenters, or uh, maybe they have gotten their institution to make backups of the textbooks in the Open Textbook Library, or they're presenters at Summit over the next two weeks, or, uh, or they create a digest of our community list or they are answering questions on our community list or asking questions on our community list. That's contributing too. Or they're creating community resources or they're sharing resources they've created at their institutions or they're interacting privately, giving moral support and encouragement on days when things don't look so good. Um, they are uh, institutions that are, um, could be doing any number of things to help with this collective effort that we have. And these are just a few examples. So this is our real community, the people who do the work, who help each other and are committed to making higher education a better place for, for all students. This is actually a photo from our summit two years ago. Um, I will admit that I miss the face-to-face in-person experience. It's a little hard to play kickball over Zoom or share a drink or uh, walk around the lake or take a riverboat cruise, but um, we're doing what we can. Uh, but we do miss, the, miss the, the people. But of course, things have changed. Things have changed since this picture was taken or since last year's summit, um, haven't they? Right, we all know that. There have been some major events that have changed our world uh, that have happened this spring tragedies that have been really hard on all of us, some maybe more than others. Um, but for me, I'll say, I'm gonna say that it's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about them a little bit because I think they'll impact our work moving forward. Um, but for me, I think it's um, sometimes takes a major event to jar me out of my complacency and, and, and recommit to the things that I, that I know are important or be reminded uh, to act on. So. So I do briefly want to talk about these two events and, and because I want you to see how, how I think they're, they're going to be impacting higher education and therefore impacting the Open Textbook Network community. And hopefully we can use those events to, for ourselves to recommit to our core principles. So the first thing I want to talk about is obviously the COVID-19 pandemic. That's obviously impacted all of our lives. And if, if you or a loved one have been impacted directly, then I'm, I'm really so sorry and our hearts go out to you. It's killed thousands of people. It continues to kill thousands of people every single day. So I don't need to tell you how much of an impact it's had on all of our lives. Um, even if you weren't directly impacted, um, it's, it's had a profound obvious impact on, on um, 
and our personal and professional lives. And we've been need, needed to take these measures to minimize uh, the impact of it. But that the virus's impact on higher education has reminded me that our work is more important than ever. Um, and our community is more important than ever. As you know, higher ed institutions responded to the virus by pivoting to virtual instruction in March. And this was a sudden, severe change that had significant impact on students and all of us, but to students as well. Uh, much of that impact is still unknown, but it is starting to, to come out. This is a survey done by the National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators. Um, they were asked, compared to 2019, did the number of students asking for more financial aid increase or decrease in the same period this year? And if they looked at March to May, there was a 47, 47% of the institutions said there was an increase in requests of students. So there are mechanisms in all of our institutions for students to say, my, something in my life has changed. I need more aid. 47% of the institutions said those, those requests increased this year, and 90% of them anticipate that those requests will increase this fall. We've already knew, and we talk about this all the time, that students have you know, financial challenges. Uh, but I think what's happened is that this tragedy of the pandemic has really exposed some of the issues, again, that we've known have been issues all along, students struggling with housing, uh, you know, homeless students, those are who are uh, food insecure, those who have mental health issues, those issues are now really amplified. So um, I, I wanna bring that up because again, I think this is uh, something that's gonna impact us moving forward. I, I know at least at my institution, at the University of Minnesota, there's a lot more attention being paid to these issues now because they are seen as being much more severe and, um, and um, we're seeing the impact uh, drastically. So that's one of the tragic events, but I do wanna bring off this, this other event. And this is, a, um, this is a hometown event for me, but I have a feeling it's had a similar impact on you. And that's the murder of George, George Floyd. Um, this seems to be something that's, um, I, don't, I don't know how you wanna say it, woken some people up. I know for me it has to some degree. Um, but I think in many, what it's done is it's sparked a commitment or a recommitment to exposing or eliminating institutional racism. Um, and, and of course, that focus has been on law enforcement. But that's law enforcement is just one sliver of our society. And so it got me thinking about um, what really sparked in me is, is, is what about higher education? So, you know, speaking for myself, you know, these two events have really challenged me in just in, in a lot of ways. It's been a really tough spring. And I think I was, uh, I'm assuming, I'm guessing for most of you as well. But they've really made me think about my work and to think about how many ways uh, we might be excluding people in higher education um, and thinking about the students most in need. That includes you know, institutional racism, uh, but also excluding people in other ways. So how has, it got me thinking, how has my institution done that, excluded people? How does the OTN exclude people? Because of the choices we've made or structure our community in our work. Who is that left out and who should be part of that conversation? So I'll get back to that a little bit later. But here's the encouraging thing. Uh, this is a word cloud made a few hours ago by our, um, uh, it was our session of, uh, for new OTN members. And the question was, what word best describes why you're passionate about open education? And you can see the answers that were given fit right into what we're talking about, don't they? These are people who are working on issues of equity, affordability, social justice. And, um, and so it's so just so encouraging to come to this community uh, who is so committed in this kind of work. This community a couple of years ago created some guiding principles, um, some guiding principles that we decided were needed to define who we are, develop 
you know, by our community for us to help guide what we do. So um, I, I'm really proud of these. I'm really proud of the work the community did on these. It took many, many months and a lot of iterations and steering committee work and writing and so on. And, and I, I wanna just really briefly, just spend a, a minute on this to talk about what these all really, really briefly mean. The common good, for instance, the common good is just a reflection of the fact of, of that's what our work is day to day. We work at institutions that work for the common good. They work to educate everyone. Um, they don't say we're here to educate the rich. No institution does, public, private, it doesn't matter. They were all created and all have missions to, to educate everyone. And so the OTN being a network of these institutions, it makes sense that that definitely is our focus as well. For number two, I think it's it's clear we all are working towards a more equitable future for all students, right? That's the vision here, that all students come out of our higher ed institutions and, and, and see their future equitably, an equitable future. And that equity doesn't happen unless we are inclusive right now of more voices to build that future. Uh, so number three, inclusivity. Number four is action, because that's one thing I think that um, people really appreciate about this community is um, that we don't just talk about the ideas, we're committed to problem solving and making changes happen. Uh, number five is humanity. And, and this is a recognition that we are all just human beings. And oftentimes we get pegged as something or another. Maybe we're pegged as consumers and we're people selling us things or we're pegged as librarians or administrators or whatever it is. And um, to be honest, this is really hard work and recognizing our own humanity and our own frailties, our own um, lived experiences. I think it sets us up to treat every individual with dignity and respect. Uh, integrity basically means that we interact with each other honestly and ethically. And shared abundance, um, that's the belief that we have that our collective knowledge, it exists in abundance. We can act that way then. We can share things. If we're not worried, of, if things are rare or not abundant, we tend to hoard them. We tend to protect them. Our, our knowledge or our shared knowledge is, there's an abundance of it. And so we want to act that way and share our knowledge as, as much as we possibly can. So, so given these, you know, these recent events um, and the, uh, you know, existing inequities that we know exist, um, you know, I'm recommitting myself to the shared work of reduce, reducing inequities in our institutions. And I, and I hope you'll join me in that recommitment. You know, how do we give voice to those who are voiceless and those who don't feel they have a stake in the educational system that it's, it's they feel that it's not built for them, it's not for them, it's not meant for them. Who are those students and how do they, um, how do we help their voices change academia? And what role does open education play in all that work? What does any of this have to do with open education? So let's talk about open education. Um, as you know, the Open Textbook Network has used the promotion of open textbooks as a strategy to get uh, faculty engaged in open education, and it's worked really well. Uh, some of them, some people though, have been a little confused by this, and understandably so, um, since our name is the Open Textbook Network. Um, thinking that open textbooks were maybe our goal, um, and not just a strategy to attain a larger goal, the goals we just got done talking about. But as you know, open textbooks are just one type of open educational resource. OER can be any type of learning object. If the creator of it decides they wanna freely share it with the world, right? We all know that. But open educational resources aren't enough either. We need to use OERs in ways that leverage the strengths and, and it leverages their strengths and benefit students. For instance, um, unless you're new to this field, you've heard of open pedagogy. Um, 
open pedagogy is a practice of engaging with students as creators of information and not just consumers of it. Open educational resources are a great platform for students to add their knowledge to. So open pedagogy is an example of an open educational practice, which is any activity that leverages an OER license to benefit practice. Right? So this, in my mind, is what open education is. It's the application of open educational practices to open educational resources and the combination of those two things. So here's why I'm bringing you this up. Um, I believe that open educational practices are activities that, that invite other voices to academia. Oh, I'll say that one more time. Open educational practices are activities that invite other voices to academia. That voice might be the instructor's voice. The instructor might revise um, an, a re, an OER to add their voice to it. They may add a local context, the voice of a local context. They may add multiple perspectives to some a field. They may add personal perceptions or a cultural lens. And as with open pedagogy, the voice might be the voice of students that get added. So I really think open educational practices are primarily about surfacing other voices. So I think that, that is really in my mind where the future of this field is, is in focusing on engaging more voices. And, um, and I think that's what the OTN needs to focus on for the foreseeable future, engaging more voices. And there are lots of layers to this now. There's um, lots of layers to engaging more voices in academia, but also there's engaging more voices in the conversations we're having in the OTN. How are we gonna design solutions to ben benefit all of higher education if, if our own perspectives in our, in our community are limited? So here are some actions that we have started to take or we will continue to take um, uh, this coming year. So we're gonna be creating um, open educational practice groups. We want to create these. These are discipline-specific communities of practice of faculty. We're calling them. We're calling them open educational practice groups, and we'd like to support these communities of faculty and perhaps others to have conversations around dis discipline-specific OER and OEP, right? Open educational practices, and we can hope. We hope that they'll collaboratively develop OER and surrounding practices that improve their teaching and their students' learning in a field. So that's something we're going to be working on this year, and you'll be hearing more about that. In the OTN, we have taken some actions already to try to reduce the barriers to joining the community. The community takes resources, right? I mean, we are, um, we are we're, we're sharing resources, but we also have shared responsibility to support the community. So it does take resources. And so that's why we have those community fees to support all of our activities. We have found ways, for instance, through allied membership to reduce uh, um, uh, the, the, the cost for an institution to join us if they're already a member of a consortium or a system that has joined us. Right? And we've figured out a way to make that work. We have opened up registrations for our workshops to not just be for our members, the OTN members, but to be most of them for um, pretty much everybody. We are starting to provide scholarships uh, need-based where the institution's um, uh, budget won't support uh, registration for a, a workshop or professional development program. And we're hoping to develop more programming this year. You'll see more coming from us about bringing more voices to this, to this table. Right. So as you can see, we're actually focused on a lot more than textbooks. We're focused on open education, all of these pieces. And the textbooks have been this strategy as we've talked about before. And we do recognize that our name, uh, the Open Textbook Network might cause some confusion in that way. Um, 
the truth is we've always been about more about more we've always been about more than textbooks and so what's happening actually is we're, we're finding that our name is is getting in the way so we've decided to make one small change uh, we're going to change our name to the open education network it's a small change but it's an important one i think it better reflects our growth um, and all that we do and hope to become and we want it to become clear that our overall goals are much more expansive than textbooks, which are a key strategy, and, uh, but they're not the end that we're aiming for. You're not going to see an immediate change here, change here, excuse me. This transition will happen over the next several months. Um, it's amazing how many documents, websites, and so on have the logo and name on them that we need to find and replace. So. So one final thought, um, I, I can't finish a presentation without a quote from Jimi Hendrix. Uh, the events of this spring have really reminded us of the importance of the work we do together. And so I, I can't stress that enough. That's what it's done for me, at least. And I, and I hope it's done that for you as well. If we're successful in bringing new voices to academia and to the OTN, uh, then that's a start. Bringing new voices is a start, but the hard part comes after that, and it starts with listening, listening to those voices. Uh, so the first step, step to, an achieve, to achieving any kind of social justice is to, to listen. So uh, let's commit to listening uh, as a community. In that spirit, I've decided to give up the last half of my summit kickoff presentation today to someone I'm just so very excited to hear from about an important part of our higher education landscape, and that's native higher education. Um, at, over the last year, I've been working with an organization called the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, and I'm really so very honored to have uh, Carrie Billy here to talk with us. Carrie Billy is a member of the Navajo Nation and an attorney from Arizona. She's the president and CEO of the American Indian, the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, or AHEC. Through AHEC, the nation's 37 tribal colleges share a common vision, strong sovereign nations through excellence in tribal higher education. Ms. Billy has an undergraduate degree from the University of Arizona and Salish, uh, Salish Kootenai College, which is a tribal college. And she earned a Juris Doctorate from Georgetown University Law Center. Ms. Billy was appointed by former President Bill Clinton as the inaugural executive director of the White House, White House Initiative on Tribal Colleges. And she worked at the US Senate for 10 years. Ms. Billy has given the, been the principal investigator on a number of federal and private grants, including research awards from the uh, NSF, NIH, NASA, the US Department of Education, Agriculture, the Lumina Foundation, USA Funds, and more. Um, she's worked to forge partnerships and coalitions and drafted legislations to designate tribal colleges as 1994 land grant institutions and to create a federal designation for Hispanic uh, serving institutions. Her career reflects a commitment to public service, to protecting and promoting the cultures, rights, and well beings of American Indians and, and Alaska Natives, and improving the quality of life and educational status for all Americans. So, with that, I'm going to step back and join all of you in listening. Carrie, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? I will get your I will get your slides up here in just one second. Okay. Hi, Carrie. Hi. Should I just go ahead and get started? Sure, that'd be great. Sorry about the transition here. Yate, Bella Don and Nishini, Tots Oni Bashishan, the Ba Dashishi, Kiani Dashanali, Namishin, Kerry Billy. As president and CEO of the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, or AHAC, I am thrilled to be here on behalf of the tribal colleges. Next. Although we are meeting virtually, uh, you can go ahead to the next, there you go. Um, so we're meeting virtually, each of us in our own place. I wanted to start by honoring and acknowledging the first people 
of the land on which I am currently located, which is in the Washington DC area. Those people are the Anacostans, Piscataway, and Algonquin people. And I hope everything that I say and do here today honors their sacrifices, prayers, and the care with which they lived on this land. Next. As Native people, we all have our own creation stories that explain our emergence from a sacred place, from the land, the water, the sky, through our stories, they differ, from they differ and vary from tribe to tribe, but we are all people of this land and this place, the United States, and that's tremendously important to everything that I will say today. Next. Now, I know that many of you probably don't know very much about tribal colleges, uh, so I wanted to start by putting the tribal college uh, movement into historical context. Then I'll talk a little bit about the importance of identity particularly within the higher education context. And I'll close by talking more specifically about tribal colleges and native student success. Next, in the pre-Columbus days, an estimated 10 million people lived on this land, the United States, speaking 1,500 languages that are found nowhere else on earth. Next, but we all know what Columbus brought when he sailed across the water onto our land. Next, years, decades, centuries of oppression, disease, near annihilation, in some cases, complete annihilation, forced marches, relocation, theft of homelands, poverty. Next, and a trail of broken promises that stretches from one end of our land to the other in all four directions. Next. Those broken promises were the hope captured in more than 400 treaties, treaties that our tribal leaders signed with the federal government beginning in 1785. Indian tribes relinquished their, their sacred lands, more than a billion acres, in exchange for treaty promises. Next. And most of those treaties included education, Education to our ancestors meant equality, new opportunity, and hope for their children as tribal people within the context of our own identity. Next. But that's not what it meant to the federal government and others. To them, education was an opportunity to crush our spirit, our songs, and to vanquish our languages, our very identity. And to a great extent, it worked. Next. Our populations dec declined, many tribes were lost, and American Indians for decades, for a century or more, faded from view. Next, we essentially became invisible as people. Next, there's a great danger when that happens to a people, as our nation is now experiencing. When there is a void, a hole of invisibility, it must be filled with something. And for Native people, that void has been filled with myths, caricatures, untruths, and next, pain, neglect, loss of identity and self-worth, and it's been replaced by generational poverty and trauma. But the resilient spirit of Indian people could not and will not be vanquished. Next. It took a while, but in the 1960s, something started to happen. Tribal colleges began to emerge onto the U.S. higher education landscape, nurtured by and in turn nurturing the land, language, culture, and distinct people who created them. Next, the first tribal college, like all that followed, was established for two reasons. The near complete failure of the U.S. higher education system to address the needs or even include American Indians. And second, the need to preserve our culture, our language, our lands, our sovereignty, our past and our future. The goal was to build an education system founded on our ways of knowing, traditional knowledge and spirituality. Next, we've grown from one tribal college to 37 institutions operating more than 75 sites in 16 states. 
uh, there are 35 accredited tribal colleges, 30, uh, the two are developing institutions, and tribal colleges together serve about 160,000 American Indians and Alaska Natives and other rural community residents every year in academic and community-based programs. Next. Our collective vision, as Dave said, is strong, sovereign nations through excellence in tribal higher education. Next. To achieve that vision, tribal colleges focus on opportunity, opportunity for a healthier life, a more stable and prosperous community, revitalized language and culture, an engaged citizenry, and a safer and more secure environment. TCU's focus on training teachers and nurses, growing an IT workforce, carpenters, electricians, water quality technicians, writers, artists, environmental managers, anything that is needed to build stronger nations. Next. And TCU's tribal colleges are building their nations one student at a time. All tribal colleges offer certificate and associate degrees. 16 offer four-year degrees, bachelor's degrees, uh, primarily in career and technical fields, such as engineering, nursing, environmental science, and teaching. The average age of a tribal college student is between 16 and 24. Most live in poverty in some of the most rural and remote regions of the country. In fact, 78% of our students receive Pell benefits, and most live in homes with extended families. Next, and then you can go on to the next one after that. In the past few years, there are, the past few years have been exciting ones for tribal colleges. They've been growth years. Next, we had our first, our first tribal college uh, two years ago began offering its first baccalaureate degree program that was entirely online. So it's our first four-year degree entirely online offered by Bay Mills Community College up in the Upper Peninsula of Min Michigan. Next, uh, we have our first ABET accredited tribal college uh, uh, bachelor degree programs at Navajo Technical University. Next. We have really strong partnerships with our K-12 schools, the local K-12 schools, the Salish Kootenai College has an afternoon STEM Academy for high school juniors and seniors. Next, we're engaged in international activities, working with indigenous people from all over the world. Next, and as Dave said, tribal colleges are the 1994 land grant institutions. Next, we are revitalizing our native languages. Uh, doing a lot of things uh, related to native language development. Next, establishing our own accrediting body. Next, and focusing on job creation. So not just creating a workforce, but actually creating jobs so we can turn around the economies up on our reservations. Next, we're conducting community and place-based relevant research. Next, and one of the really exciting things is that we have a whole new generation of tribal college leadership growing up around us. Uh, in the past 13 year, three years, we've had about 13 um, new tribal college presidents, maybe even more than that. Uh, so I call this the second circle of the tribal college movement. Next, but we do face challenges, tremendous challenges. And I think particularly re related to the Open Education Network um, I think it's important to note, this, th this slide was produced by Illuminative, so you could go to illuminative.org and learn more about this important work to um, quash that invisibility and uh, restore identity of Native people, I'll tell truthful stories from our perspective. Um, and something very related to that that I think is important to your work is that 27 states make no mention of a single Native American in K-12 curriculum. So you're, you're talking about higher ed, but this is the foundation that students are coming to higher education in 27 states, no mention. 87% of states fail to cover American Indians beyond 1900. That's how some, that's how people become invisible. Next. We face other challenges. Tribal colleges are very rural and remote institutions. As I mentioned earlier, some of the most rural um, places in the country have a tribal college. A lot of us, our students come unprepared for uh, higher education academics. So there's a, a lot of developmental education. We have uh, behavioral and generational health problems, a lack of fiscal resources. Tribal colleges are also some of the poorest institutions in the country. And, um, as I said earlier, our students are uh, under-resourced as well. So the open, 
especially the open textbooks, but all, all open educational resources, I, I, I do think provide tremendous opportunity for our students. Um, we have faculty and administrations who are working multiple hats, serving, doing a lot of different functions. So um, a lot of challenges in general. Um, next. So in normal times, tribal colleges are doing work in challenging circumstances. And you, when you add a pandemic to that, at times the mountain to the other side seems nearly but not completely unattainable. The health status physically and mentally of our students and communities lags behind the rest of the nation. And today, as some of you probably know, our tribal nations are being hit harder by the COVID-19 pandemic than many other co uh, communities in this country, along with other communities of color. color. Next. Even before the pandemic, tribal colleges on average had the worst internet access at the highest cost of any institution of higher education in this country. And except for two, one or two tribal colleges, our colleges aren't part of the state or regional higher education networks. So this map, you can kind of see where those state and regional networks are and then where tribal colleges are. You just kind of look where there's a big gap and that's generally in the Indian country where tribal colleges are. Next. Our internets operate at the slowest speeds and our communities have the least access. Uh, many have no internet access and our equipment is older uh, than the national averages and uh, there is less of it available. Next, but as I said, we are resilient people and from that resiliency, from the resiliency of our ancestors, we are finding the strength to innovate, adapt and fulfill our mission and we think that opportunities like the Open Education Network uh, will help us as we continue to innovate, adapt, next, and most important, tell our story. Tribal colleges are using their voices to reinsert ownership of our narrative, our stories, our culture, and our future. Next, we celebrate who we are as distinct people always. And one of the things that sets us apart is the attention to culture. Culture is the core of all tribal colleges, teaching from a native worldview, having language requirements. I like one, the way one student uh, put it to me a few years ago. He said, we start every week with a pipe and end every week with a drum. Culture and coming from that native worldview isn't something that's added to tribal college. It, it is who they are. And it's from that culture, that core, that tribal colleges teach their students. Next. Tribal colleges have a, a real commitment to native students, focusing everything they do on their identity, spirituality, ceremony, place, community, the personal gifts that each one of our students bring, and of course, tribal scholarship, tremendously important. So tribal colleges already are taking existing curriculum and adapting it to their particular location and to the needs of their community and their tribes. Next, that tribal ownership is particularly important. Tribal colleges are actually chartered by federally recognized Indian tribes or the federal government. So that foundation, that government to government relationship and sovereignty, tribal control, uh, which is, is critically important to tribal colleges. And that's really what ensures that tribal colleges teach from their own native worldview. Next. Also important, our family, community, land. Next. And everything tribal colleges do, everything they teach their students and they learn together is working toward that goal that we all share in common, that vision of strong, sovereign tribal nations through excellence in tribal higher education. Next. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to me today. Um, and I appreciate this opportunity and hope that we can uh, be part of your future and that you are part of ours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie. That was really wonderful. Um, and and, uh, and really inspiring, actually. And, and uh, I really appreciated you taking the time here today on fairly short notice to uh, to uh, educate us all. Sure, thank do we you. Yeah, do we have time for some questions? Carrie, are you willing to, if there are any questions at all by the, by the group, you're willing to answer some questions? Yes, okay. sure. Thank you.
This is a great time if you have questions to use the question and answer feature in Zoom. Um, we have a few minutes uh, where we can see questions for Carrie or for Dave. So I see one question from uh, Esperanza. Hi, Esperanza. Uh, are there any inter intersections in the work that um, historically black colleges and universities and tribal colleges are doing to address inequities? Do you know of any, Carrie? Well, you know, tribal colleges, um, AHEC, are our organization work really closely with other um, organizations of color. We work with Nafio, Haku, um, UNCF, and uh, Thurgood Marshall all the time on a number of initiatives. And we've had these great partnerships where tribal colleges are working together with HBCUs and HSIs on issues that are important. So there's a, a lot of examples that I could provide of ways that we're working together and learning together and share stories. And Probably, you know, the the real essence of everything that we do with other with our partner with our partner um, institutions and organizations is learning from each other. And we found that the most um, productive um, opportunities that we have together are to visit each other's campus and to share our stories. We find so many commonalities. So I think that if there's a lesson in there, the work that AHAC um, does with UNCF and our other partners, it's that actually taking the time to be present with each other, visit each other and hear each other is tremendously important. And that's really how you make these lasting partnerships and lasting change. Thank you. Um, another question from Dragon. Uh, is there a place to see examples of tribal college adaptations or revisions of, say, open textbooks or originally created textbooks to share? I, I don't know of any open textbooks that tribal colleges have um, taken and adapted. Although I will say that almost everything has to be adapted because, um, you know, that statistics I showed earlier about the um, education not being taught from a native worldview. So I think probably if you went to any tribal college and ask any faculty member, they can show you how they've adapted um, instruction. One of the best examples we have at AHEC is a project we worked on that was funded by the National Science Foundation uh, called, um, oh, let me think of it, Indigenous Problem-Based Learning. So we actually originally got a grant from uh, uh, the National Science Foundation to do a project to teach tribal colleges faculty about problem-based learning uh, and learning from that experiential point of view. Our Tona Autumn Community College, um, which is in the southern part of Arizona, took that um, problem-based learning and added, using the AHEC Indigenous Evaluation Framework, Indigenous Problem-Based Learning, and so they started in their math and science curriculum and changed that. So now their calculus, environmental science is all taught from an autumn worldview. Um, using the, for calculus, it's taught using a man in the maze um, metaphor. And uh, I can't remember how they do environmental science, but the faculty who did that, who've translated their, those courses, um, have had tremendous success with them. In fact, their calculus teacher says that he never, he'd been teaching calculus for 20 years and, I, and he, but he never really felt like he was teaching calculus until he did this new curriculum because it was so meaningful to see the change in his students. Um, and there have been papers written about their work, which I could share the links to those. Thank you, Carrie. Um, let's see, uh, are there some, here's another one uh, from Sharon Clapp. Are there some good open history works that we can look at that will cover so-called US history from a native perspective? Uh, does anyone know? And thank you, Carrie, this is exciting work that tribal colleges and universities are doing. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't know of any, but, um, but I'm not, you know, not really in the open, textbook right. world, so I wouldn't know that, but we have people, Dave, you might know, um, there are things that are out there, um, and we hope to actually create more. One that I will say, um, 
that really isn't classified as an open, it is an open educational resource, is the Smithsonian, the National Museum of the American Indian, um, mm -hmm. called, I think it's 365. It's another link that we can send you, but a lot of great information on um, Native history from a Native point of view. Mm. Wonderful. Um, next question uh, uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, there, this might be too targeted, but are you aware of any excellent OER resources, even if they're not textbooks, that collect tribal legends and myths I teach the Navajo emergent story in my American Lit survey and would love to find more high quality OER material. Oh, well, that's great. Um, I'm really glad you're interested. And um, we can send you or send some links maybe to Dave of potential uh, resources. I do think the, I think it's called Native 365 or Native 360. Uh, on the National Museum of the American Indian is probably a good starting point, but there's more. Um, Great. Particularly actually on Navajo. Okay. Um, April, I don't know how to pronounce that first word. M-V-T-O, is that correct? So it looked like she was saying hello to you, Carrie. Really appreciate your talk from a reconnecting Black Seminole. Oh, great. Thank you. Good to know you're there. Um, could part, this is from Ramun, excuse me if I pronounced that wrong. Could part of the problem with internet access be similar to limited access in many US rural areas and what are some possible solutions do you think? Yeah, uh, there, it, it is very similar. We actually had an initiative, um, well the thing is um, laying fiber is very expensive and there's not, right. um, you know, it's just not productive. It's not um, cost benefit beneficial for, private companies to do it. So it really has to be looked at as a public good. That's something that whether it's a, a tribe, tribal, tribal land or just rural America, it's the same kind of issue, the lack of connectivity. So what tribal colleges are doing, and I think some tribes, tribes are doing this also, um, rather than trying to, you know, just give a student or a family a, a mobile hotspot, in our communities, that doesn't work because there has to be something for that to connect to. Right. So what we're doing is putting up hotspots, local community hotspots. So students will still have to drive to those hotspots to connect, but they won't have to drive 50 miles or 100 miles or 20 miles to the tribal college to sit in their parking lot. They can um, unfortunately sit in a parking lot that's closer to their home, but at least they're closer to their home and they're still right. physically distancing. That's a short-term solution, but long-term, we really have to have the will, I think, as a nation mm -hmm. to um, bring connectivity um, throughout the entire country. Right. April corrected me, or, or educated me, I should say, and, and tr uh, see if I can pronounce moto. M -U she tried to phonetically spell it for me, the word I was sort of looking for. She said, thank you, Ian Matoki. I'm sorry for slaughtering that. Um, yeah, you know, it looks very similar to um, Muscovy. I think that's it. There you go. Thank you. Um, from Colleen, I recently learned, I think we have time for one more here. So from Colleen, I recently learned about the traditional knowledge labels. Do tribal, tribal college faculty use these? And she pointed a, to a URL um, in the chat. I don't know if you can see that, Carrie, or not. Uh, I will share my screen if you want. Oh, do I? I don't, I don't do, know. She's wondering if tribal colleges use these. Traditional knowledge labels. Well, ah, that's interesting. I have no idea, but I can ask. Um, yeah, it, it, it is a, you know, the, just the issue of sharing traditional knowledge outside of the tribe, the actual tribe whose knowledge who owns that knowledge 
is, uh, especially with some tribes, very controversial. So I think labels like that would be very important. And then, of course, stories um, differ from just even within within one tribe, um, differ depending by families or or clan or um, or group. So um, I think right. things like that could be useful, but I, I really don't know anything about it. Sorry. Thank you. We have a few more questions here, but I'm sorry we're a little we're out of time. It appears, Carrie. Thank you again so much for your time, and um, we really really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, and good luck the rest of the week. Thank you. Sarah, do you want to wrap it up? Yeah, thank you so much, Carrie, and thank you, Dave, so much. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, a few reminders that uh, today's webinar has been recorded and it will be shared um, in the next couple of weeks, and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive a notification. Slides will also be linked there. Um, and it will also include a transcript of today's session. Um, this session was also live tweeted, so feel free to check out the summit hashtag at OTN Summit 20. There are some really wonderful posts, so thank you so much. Um, if you are an OTN member, um, you are always welcome to keep the conversation going in the OTN Google group. Um, thank you so much for joining today's session, and we look forward to seeing you at the other summit sessions over the next two weeks. So thank you all so much and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.